Hey guys, I'm Perry Nemiroff, and welcome back to Collider Best of the Week, a show that is all about recapping some of the best moments from Collider Video and Collider.com. Just in case you can't watch everything, we're going to have all the highlights right here for you. But then again, if you do watch and read everything, this is a great place to relive some of the best of the best. First up on today's agenda, as always, it's movie talk. And the first story we're going to hit over there is the shakeup going on over at Warner Brothers, which is basically that now Jeff Johns and John Berg are in charge of the DC slate of films. Now, while it's nice to know that Warner Brothers heard our reaction to BVS and they're shaking things up a little bit, who knows what's going to come of this? Either way, it does seem like a good idea to be streamlining the creative guidance over there. And I love the idea that they're focusing on making filmmaker driven films. Let's check out what the panel thought. Confusing, um, because the I'm sure we're going to hear on both sides here, but I think part of it is why tell us this now? Hasn't this kind of been the way that it's been working? Has this not? Is this is this brand new? Hearing it officially announced is kind of cool. It just feels very cosmetic, and it feels like nothing. They didn't make any new hires. These are all people who've been working there for years, all in the same capacity for years, doing the same thing, reporting to the same people. So. I don't really understand, like, what is the big news? The big thing I see in this is that they still want to remain fi uh, filmmaker-driven. Warner Brothers wants to remain filmmaker-driven, right. where we have heard from this company that, hey, guys, it's really hard to go after just the huge blockbusters and then do independent films. So we were worried that the middle class is going to be cut out. Maybe this is a ray of hope that they're still going to focus on some of those kind of movies that aren't just either giant blockbusters or tiny independent films that they acquire, that they still want to make original-feeling content. Now on to a film that's making a big impression in all the wrong ways, it's Ghostbusters. And while I'm not entirely sold on the film just yet, this new trailer that dropped I think is much better than all the previous ones. It's got some better visuals, better jokes, and it's just all around more fun and a much better edited trailer too, might I add. Let's check out what the panel thought about that one. I actually, I like this trailer, but once again, it felt a little weird. It To me, in this trailer, and every trailer I've seen, even though this was a much better trailer, I just feel like these people, like everyone involved is just playing dress up and they're just like pretending like, oh, let's make a Ghostbusters movie. It doesn't feel like the actual like Ghostbusters and the scene in the concert is this a Ghostbusters movie, is it a Bill and Ted's movie? And then the ghost, the ghost is on Leslie Jones' shoulder and then people are taking selfies with the, it's like, uh, no. You're telling me you would not try to Facebook Live if you saw a ghost at a concert. You're telling me if I was Harlow, if I was a, a while, not if I was next to the thing, if I was a, in the balcony, like Waldorf and Star, Stanley, the two of us. Yeah, sure. Why not? We're going to wrap up our movie talk section of the show with the discussion about the new Transformers 5 title, not necessarily because the last night is the greatest thing ever, but because it's a lot of fun to make fun of Roca for liking the franchise. I absolutely buy this. Absolutely buy this. I love the title because, look, you're not looking for any kind of godfather in the Transformers movies. You're going to have a good time, turn your brain off, and see what craziness Michael Bay is going to do for you. This is Optimus Prime. Sell my own movie. I am selling this stupid thing. What? Uh, the it, title it, or the it, movie? It's selling the title okay. last night. Unless uh, unless it's the last night I ever have to see Transformers <laughs> of my life. And the reason why I sell it too, just on the name of the title, like it's not enough to get somebody who's not in locked into this Transformers movie series so far. It's not enough to be like the last night. Well, that's really intriguing. Like, what are they going to talk about here? It just seems like a cheesier kind of title than I would have hoped for. So. Now over to Jedi Council, where the main topic this week was that leaked artwork from the Rogue One visual guide. Now, if you happen to have seen it already, good for you, because it was some pretty incredible stuff. But at the same time, as you all know, it's never a good thing when key information gets out there before a studio or a filmmaker is ready to release it. So let's see what the panel thought about that and how it's going to change the trajectory of the marketing campaign from here on out. Because everyone knows Vader's in it now. Were they going to maybe hold Vader back? back for the trailers or you know and wait for the next trailer or now you like they know he's in it let's just go forward with it now. i love the question but i think they were going to go forward with it anyway, anyway. i yeah. think that but maybe they, more now I, I yeah maybe even more so maybe you put your foot on the gas a little bit more but i think that when we get the new trailer that we think we're going to get at star wars celebration in early july you're going to see darth vader i think you would have seen darth vader in there anyway but i don't want them to be too liberal now though with showing us all of darth vader i want a good tease like mm -hmm. don't show me everything the guy's doing in the movie just show me the mask show me the breathing show me maybe a lightsaber lighting up that's all i need from darth vader until i actually see the movie i yeah. think rebels have done a really good job like that as well where they're not overindulging the vader parts it's just kind of teasing it through and that's yeah. what we need we 
Now over to Heroes, where they didn't do a traditional episode, but rather a special, and it's called X-Men Road to Apocalypse. The panels spoke a little bit about each film in the X-Men franchise, and whether you want a brief review about each movie or just need the key details as a quick refresher before Apocalypse comes out on May 27th, this thing is a must-watch. Let's check out a quick highlight reel. A lot of people were afraid of superhero films, and they were especially afraid of them being taken seriously. Everything had to have that Batman-y, like, well, look, you know, Batman was, you know, the Tim Burton Batman was taken seriously, but everything wasn't like, I think X-Men put it on the map, like the ability that you can take these characters seriously. There's that great moment at that conference that uh, Jean Grey is speaking at, mm -hmm. and you see them as, as older men, and it immediately sets up a tone that you're not expecting at all from a superhero film. I mean, I remember seeing it, it's just, I left the theater like, what did I just see? I don't even know what this is. You had Professor X standing at the end, like a bizarre CG, creepy, uncanny valley. Professor X like, come on and get in my Quinjet. It was weird. I like the Victor Creed storyline. I mm -hmm. like the fact that he was portrayed by Lee Shriver. I thought that stuff was, was worth watching. It's when they horribly botch the superhero elements or the other mutant elements in this movie that they didn't need, <laughs> you know, frankly. I love this movie. Uh, I, I love it the most for successfully executing a version of a specific classic X-Men story. Um, so as an adaptation, uh, it, it put across the story of like, it, which is only two issues in the original X-Men run, but right. became two of the most famous issues of any comic ever written because they were so effective. Um, and, you know, as a Kitty Pride fan, it hurts me that she's not at the center of the story, but that's how I know how good the movie was. I don't even mind. Mm -hmm. I don't even mind that they changed it up. For their characters and their circumstances, it made perfect sense to send Wolverine. Uh, and here's where, like, the movie verse has started to make real positive contributions to X Men canon at large, because the movie version of Mystique is better than the comic book version. Somewhat similarly, over at Collider.com, Adam Chitwood took it upon himself to rewatch all the X-Men movies and then rank them from worst to best. Me personally, I would have X2 at number one, but let's see what Adam put them all at. Now over to TV Talk, where we've got a lot going on. It's Upfronts right now, and if you don't know what Upfronts are, it's basically a time where the broadcast networks renew and cancel shows, they release schedules, and they also go out to advertisers, so it means we get a lot of first look material. So there's a lot of shows to cover, but first let's hit ABC, which slashed and burned quite a bit last week. I think the stuff at ABC and Kara was, we were talking before the, the show started, there's a lot of things going on behind with uh, executive shakeups and all this stuff. I will say, I don't think sh they should have canceled Nashville. Nobody was actually watching Muppets. Uh, the whole castle thing, I think you saw a stone going downhill, so it was only a matter of time. And I think Nathan Fillion will pick up something here ASAP. The tragedy for me in all of these announcements is The Muppets, not because it got canceled, but because they did it such a disservice. When I heard The Muppets were coming back, I was like, this is gonna be great! And then The Muppets came back and I was like, oh my God, what did you do to my childhood? Everybody yeah. thought that. Like, last year, the upfronts, every board, every blog, everything was like, Muppets are coming back, revival of the thing. And I was excited for my niece and nephew to see Muppets and what I saw as a kid and Muppet Babies, the cartoon. <laughs> nothing. It wasn't even funny. No, there was, yeah. there was nothing so behind it. I'm sad for Agent Carter because I, I tweeted this early in the week. I said, I think Agent Carter could have been a great show. There was a great show lurking there somewhere. You have somebody like Haley Atwell with all that charisma, all that passion. She's a fiery actress. I love her. She can do, it's just range too. I've seen her in period piece uh, dramas over there in, in the UK, but she can also come to the States and, and and kick ass too and it's just the too king bad of the period the piece, king of, I, I love my period pieces so it's just a shame <laughs> that she wasn't given a better opportunity or a better yeah. show to work with it We've got a whole bunch of high-profile projects coming to CBS, like the new Star Trek series, for instance, but the panel harped on the new MacGyver show quite a bit. Let's see what they thought about that. Of these two shows, I'm most excited about MacGyver because the guy who can make bombs out of anything and that's cool. We can put him anywhere. He can work with the, you know, the FBI. He can work, he can be sold. He can do whatever he wants. But do you think Lucas Till is too young? Yeah. That was my that, That's Cyclops' brother. I know it's Cyclops. Yeah. Yeah. He, he can be guy who's like a 40 year old guy with a mullet. Lucas Till is but, just like hipster dude long fair. hair. Fair, but we've, we've noticed CBS, even though we think they appeal to, to, to your mom. I'm not trying to age your mom or my mom, you know, hey. which are, you know, beautiful women, love, you know, in their prime, love, in their prime. Um, I'm a very happy CBS watcher. They are going younger. Look at Scorpion. They are yeah. starting to go a little bit younger. You know, they're not, I, I think they're appealing to their demographic, but they also have fans like Big Bang Theory fans, which are young and old. So I think going with a guy around his age is gonna be fine. Okay. I'm more excited about MacGyver, the, 
CBS doing an Anton Fuqua training day worries me. That show was gritty, L.A., dark. I mean, I don't think they're, they're not going to go to – I know they can't do the language thing, but they're not going to go to that level where Denzel and Ethan Hawke took it. I mean, Denzel won an Academy Award after that. I mean, come on. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think that's a good pickup for CBS. And Bill Paxton? Bill Paxton well, in the Denzel role? If you watch, Game over, man. It's if, game over. If you watch Predator 2, <laughs> an early Bill Paxton role, he was, Aliens. A, he was a great yeah. cop in, uh, in, in yeah, Predator 2. Uh, do I think that training day is a good idea? Absolutely not. Now it's time for the Collider.com portion of the show where we get to highlight some features written by the incredible staff over there. First up is a very interesting read from Brian Formo exploring how Civil War makes some of the same mistakes that Batman vs Superman does, but it's less obvious due to the flow and pacing of the film. While I do definitely prefer one of those movies to the other, there really is no denying that both are guilty of a lot of the same mistakes based on the way that Brian breaks it down. We've also got two finale reviews for you, one for the season finale of Bates Motel from Allison Keene and another for the surprise series finale of Castle from David Oliver. In that piece, he covers the show's rise and fall and also wraps up with an assessment of the final episode and whether or not that tacked on ending worked. If you are pumped for Warcraft, this one's for you. Matt Goldberg got the chance to visit ILM and learn all about the visual effects, an experience that left Matt stunned by the work detail and the craft that went into making the film. This next article is a good one, but it's important to note that this isn't anything official. It is speculation from Collider.com's Jave Trumbor. He highlights the continued references to Hal Jordan, the Green Lanterns, and the 2009 DC Comics crossover event Blackest Night on the DC TV shows. He goes on to discuss exactly what the Blackest Night is and whether or not adapting it is a good idea or even a possibility given the current state of the DC TV shows. We're going to wrap this segment up with a little Game of Thrones. Collider.com has a piece up and running that looks back on everything that the super manipulative Littlefinger engineered throughout the show. After laying out all those details, we bring the question to you in poll format. What do you think Littlefinger is up to now? Cast your votes and check out the results on Collider.com. Now who's ready for a little schmodown action? This week on the show, we've got the number one contender, Dan Merle, facing off against Scott Mance, who is a pro at movie dates. But it's too bad that movie dates don't really factor into the score there. Let's check out a brief tease of that. Dan, it's a whole different can of worms here. Nothing but love and respect for Dan, the man. He is the Citizen Kane of movie fighters. Scott Mance uses that crazy energy as a smokescreen. He uses it as a distraction for his opponents, and you saw how it worked last time, but it doesn't work on me. He is the encyclopedia, ladies and gentlemen, the Mance Man, Scott Mance! Oh, he's got a Bestman shirt oh on! Oh my God! He's got a Bestman oh. shirt on! He did he oh. Screen Junkies Movie Fights Champion, ladies and gentlemen, Dangerous Dan Merle! Wait a minute, that's oh, not Oh, that's Dan. not Dan Merle. That's not Dan, that's Andy Sandler. Oh, that's John Bailey. Oh. It's the NWO, and there oh, he is. Oh my God, there he is. What is this here? Goodness. What is this here? Oh my goodness, the what Screen Junkies this? are what? here. Here we go. Give me the Rap. freaking evil eye here. It's, that's what he's doing. He's there to intimidate. <laughs> what, what the hell is this? You got he's allowed to do that. It's like a foul shot thing. Andy, they, <laughs> what it's, is happening right now? John Roca is supporting. I don't know what is happening. All right. Which actor has the record for most Oscar nominations without a single win? Oh, Peter O'Toole. Correct. Oh, the man's big, man. Big group three. He accessed great. Hollywood there, guys. Am I right there? Was... In movie quotes. Name the movie. Oh, this is going to be fun. We can stay up late, swapping manly stories, and in the morning, I'm making waffles. Shrek. That is correct. correct. Dan Merle, five Dan to four. Dan Merle, what my goodness. What a battle. What First a round. battle. Five Woo. to four. These are the contenders. There is a reason they are in the title contention. Now let's jump into Meme of the Week, the time where we get to highlight a meme sent in by one of you great viewers that pertains to a certain something that happened on one of the shows this week. And as you might know, there was a certain Tetris rant, so a lot of the art that came in focused on that. Let's check out this meme from The Giggle Skull on Twitter. If you find this amusing, just wait until you see this week's blooper reel. Do you want your meme featured on the show next week? Then pick your favorite moment from one of our shows, turn it into a meme or a piece of artwork, and then mail it in to mailbag at collider.com. Put meme in the subject line. We'll go through them, and, you know, maybe your artwork will be here next week.
Oh, hey, how about some bloopers? You know that's what you've been waiting for. Who wants some rants, singing, and shit rats? Let's roll it. Hey, everyone, I am Perry Nemiroff. <laughs> how dare you? You know what's a cool surprise if there's three of them? They haven't even made the first one yet. <laughs> They're announcing a goddamn trilogy of Tetris. <laughs> like, you shave your head and go to sleep because there's no way it can be good. There's no way. Hey, guys, for Collider. <laughs> oh, I got two words out. Oh, wait till you see the cool surprise about Tetris, the movie trilogy. Suck it, man. I don't care. <laughs> Uh, okay, guys. <laughs> you know Jupiter Ascending? Everybody hated that movie. Oh, oh, I got it. Yes, 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 that movie is garbage. And she won't it's good. It's not a bad movie. You guys, we get some uh, It's not a bad yeah. movie. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So, I mean, the genius with Dermot McRolney. <laughs> this week focused a lot on the new McGruber. MacGruber? MacGyver! I want a MacGruber show. What is it? Oh, we've got to save the world from aliens, so we train these dudes to create a Tetris wall around Earth. Ooh, I'm shocked and amazed at your incredible science fiction trilogy. Mark? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the last one, I got real drunk and, 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 exactly. and high exactly. and That's enjoyed I, mean. I enjoyed the hell out of those two and a half, three hours that was you in the theater. You were drunk and high. Because he doesn't and, remember it. That's why. Right. so much he, fun. He, he, Oh boy, this is gonna be a day. Great, <laughs> a lot of people are really mad at Ellis right now. Uh, one person, they're like, "How dare you, Mark? Raphael is the emotional tension." Uh, although one person said, it, "Oh well, what about Lego? That surprised everybody. It didn't surprise that many people because Lego has got an entire universe around it. There's like little Lego characters based on all different products. In fact, you could probably have a Tetris Lego set. Suck on that." It's with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Kate taking. He's cake eating so cake. much cake! Eating the cake. <laughs> Put the mud on your face. Go up, hold, hold up the torch, scream at the top of your lungs. Just do it, get into it. He's, he's there for sport. He could legit cut a whole blooper reel. Blooper reel. He, can, he can cut a, he can cut a whole blooper reel. Oh my god. It's a stamp, the stamp, it's a stamp, that marble. I drink your milkshake. I drink it up. Drink the milkshake. All of it. Drink it. I'm also... Yeah, that's yeah. So I'm also on Twitter as well. At Griffin D and uh, <laughs> David Griffin, King of the Ultras. <laughs> Tetris is a bunch of shapes. Give me a break. And that's all we've got for you on this episode of Best of the Week. You know the drill. We love hearing from you. So hit the comment section below and share some of your favorite moments from Collider Video and Collider.com. For Best of the Week, I am Perry Nemroff. You can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemroff. Be sure to go and bookmark Collider.com, subscribe to the Collider Video's YouTube channel, and watch and read everything. But just in case you can't, that's what Best of the Week is for. See you next week. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.